the first day that I haven't had to wear a nice dress shirt for um, instructional purposes. What, just to prove that you knew how to do it or? Yeah, I wanted to show everybody I knew how to use buttons. Snaps, and then, not so much, but buttons. I and got. then you were, you were able to put the shirt on and take the shirt off all by yourself? Whoa, sir. <laughs> Let's not get You're right. Screen. You're right, right, right. That's that's calculus. That's calculus. Yeah. I I mean, you know, putting it on is one thing, not a problem. But I just tear them off when I'm done because I, I can't figure out the buttons. Like I'm doing <laughs> them. It's too much. Too much. Everything should I have was, is I was under the impression shirts are always one one use only, right? They're like tissues. Of course. I me and Hulk Hogan have that in common. I was gonna go Mary Antoinette, but I'll accept yours as more relevant. <laughs> or at least more timely. Good Lord. Mary Antoinette. I don't really get the joke either. I don't. History doesn't. She famously only ever wore an outfit one time and made a big deal about it. Oh, see, I knew about the cake and the beheading, but I was unaware of the single use outfit. So now well, I learned she never said today. the cake thing. The cake thing? So so you were not aware of that. That was not a thing she did. Oh, no, I knew that it was a thing that she didn't actually do, but it was a thing that she did with air quotes. I know histories. Uh, oh, I know both of them. <laughs> There's at least two. Oh, shall we? I'm waiting for hours. Oh, hello, alleged human, and welcome to the Chaos Lover Podcast. My name is Ned, and I'm definitely not a robot. Listen, if you remove my head, I die. I don't just continue to function absolutely normally until I realize my body has been detached. That would be insane. <sighs> With me is Chris, who is also here. How's your head, buddy? I'm deeply unsettled, and I'd prefer you to keep a healthy distance. <laughs> well, that's why we do this over Zoom now. Healthier. You kept requesting a longer table, and after a while, I just ran out of leaves I could put in the table. <laughs> what are we going to do? What are you going to do indeed? Oh, invest in plexiglass. You know, I think that... That was the second, the next move in the process. But you, you were like, zoom it. And I was like, all right, fine, fine. Look, I was gonna, I was all about putting you in the cone of silence, but then you balked when you were like, what, there's no oxygen in there? Like, excuses. Well, you know, I am a human that needs oxygen, Chris. And that's, that's truth that I'm saying right here and right now. Yeah. Everyone believes you is what's important. Excellent. Should we talk about some tech garbage? Sure. Surely. Let's talk about Security Field Day number 10. Number 10. The Security Fieldening. I feel like we've made that joke already. Constantly. Excellent. Probably the only joke we ever actually make. <laughs> uh, consistency is key. <laughs> What's important is it was another field day. Yay. The most recent security field day namely the 10th one on record was two weeks ago i think i don't know how calendars work but it was november 8th you do the math for yourself mm -mm. um it was a one-day deal uh for people who want to see the entire thing including recordings of the sessions uh they are available at techfieldday.com slash event slash xfd10 that's an x not an s x as in excellent um and of course, there was a healthy amount of live tweeting throughout the entire event. So you can search for that on the Twitters at hashtag XFD10. So just as a reminder um, to highlight exactly what a field day is, we probably don't have to spend a ton of time on this. Um, we probably talk about like three field days a year. Yeah. But basically, yeah, field day is put together by a company called Gestalt IT and is an opportunity for vendors and a small number of tech luminaries, which they refer to as delegates, to get together and discuss something. They're broken up into all different kinds of things. There's a standard generic one. There's one for cloud. There's one for networking. There's one for AI these days. There's one for edge. There's one for Canasta, strangely. Um, <laughs> They've been around for a while, is what I'm saying. Yeah, Canasta's um, been around and actually, for a really long time. 
they are they have just i think closed up shop the last one of the calendar year was mobility field day that just finished on november 15th and 16th okay um which i missed but i saw some highlights on the twitters and looked they looked good for people that look like mobiles <laughs> i think that was about i was skimming um sometimes the events are full deals live and in color in san jose california generally mm -hmm. sometimes they travel like your recent trip to boston i believe uh, less than recent but certainly this year and uh sometimes they do like mini sods at other conferences like the vmware conference which mm -hmm. always changes its name and i refuse to recognize by what they call it now um, and sometimes like this time it was just a one-off everything was entirely remote all the delegates all of the presenters um and we did the thing oh and i got a snack box that was fun that is my like my favorite part about doing the remote ones is that because the tradition is as a delegate they give you a whole bag of snacks when you get there instead of doing that they give you a credit to i forget the name of the the website but it's basically you get to pick your own snacks and then you get a big box of snacks yeah actually do you want to just cut the tech crap and talk about snacks i would love because to. i got some watermelon licorice that i have some serious opinions about i got a brownie from this snack service and at the time i did not realize that the brownie was gluten-free and let me tell you absolute garbage do not get a gluten-free brownie just love yourself and get some just plain old chocolate if what you want is just the do chocolate, it. just do the chocolate um, I also got a healthy comportment of uh, Stroop waffle because, of course, I did. Yes. How do you say no, really? <laughs> How do you say no in Stroop? I don't know. No. There you go. There it is. I think it's really that's that's what you have to do. <laughs> I was more of a French than a German, but they're very closely related. What are we talking about? <laughs> Snacks, I think. <laughs> so security field day, all one day, two major pre presenters. Um, one was Forward Networks and the other was Druva. I want to spend most of our time talking about forward networks. Um, not that I didn't think that Druva had an interesting product, but it's very similar to what they've talked about quite a bit in the past. The coolest thing about Druva that I still think is awesome, especially from a security perspective, is the way that they handle their um, keys. Basically, nobody can read your backups except for you, including Druva. That sounds pretty like good. at all. So that's pros and cons to that approach. <laughs> the pro is you can't get more secure than that. The con is if you mess up, you're in trouble. Yeah. Well, it's just like running your own PKI, right? If you screw right. it up, you have no one else to go to and be like, how? <laughs> so, and I mean, there are different levels of what Druva can do. So there are certainly, you can set up, get out of jail free card types of accounts and things like that so that they give you the option if you're not um, comfortable with the idea of if we screw up, everything is completely out the window. Uh, but what I liked about Druva in particular was just like their default product is we're going to make this as secure as humanly possible for your backups in the cloud. It's not going to make a difference. We can't get into it. Nobody but you can. All right. I support that. And they had cool um, um, diagrams. Ooh. I liked their diagrams. Oh, I do like a good picture. Which is ironic. Yes, they did, they did a good job. So there. much on podcasts. So, you know, like I said, not to give Druva short shrift, but I really want to focus on what um, Forward was doing because I think it's interesting in two reasons. One is the technology that they brought to the table, but the other is the concept and what their like business approach is. Their entire product is network monitoring and management, right? But what they do is design and build an entire digital twin of your infrastructure. Hmm. Now, a digital twin is not a new idea. Um, the general definition is a virtual replica of your physical environment. Mm -hmm. um, it is not a production network. Bits and bytes do not actually travel in the virtual twin, but it's a replica or a model, if you will, of all of the devices the connections, the rules, the behaviors of all of the different things on there, including users, to allow you to simulate real world conditions in a, a sandboxed environment, really. Mm -hmm. 
Forward has been doing this for a while and they leverage the concept to create highly detailed network models that allow for, quote, deep analysis, troubleshooting, prediction of network behavior, and verification of network security policies, unquote. So basically, they take a look at your network, they ingest a whole bunch of information about what you're doing, what your devices are, and then they simulate what they can do and you can ask that model what if questions so that you can interrogate your network without actually interrogating your network. <laughs> right. Uh, there are certainly situations where that's not feasible. Uh, what if or I advisable. this bit? Yeah. Um, so like I said, first of all, the digital twin idea is not unique to forward, but I think that they are definitely taking it as far as they possibly can and have sort of really embraced it. But we kind of talked about this last week with the, the company who's already, already forgotten how to pronounce them, CHKK. It's just check. Yeah, I was afraid you were going to say that. Um, <laughs> the way that they do it is similar. They model your Kubernetes cluster before you do blah, right? Yeah, to a certain degree. Um, they understand the signature of your Kubernetes cluster, and so they can compare that to other signatures and pull out what the potential faults or issues are with, a, with an upgrade or existing issues you might have that you don't know about yet because you haven't tripped over that particular rake, but it's sitting there. It's just waiting for you. Yeah. And that's, that is also an advantage of a company like that, that has a whole bunch of customers is that you can kind of crowdsource knowledge. Right. Right. The, the thing that check was relying on. And I gotta say, when I first looked at the name, I was like, is this in Wookiee? This is a Wookiee name, right? But it <laughs> You can't have that many K's in something and it not have something to do with the Wookiees. But anyway, so I digress from there. The actual sources that they're pulling from, for the most part, is blog posts and uh, release notes and change logs and just publicly available information. Um, they're not pulling in data from their customers directly. So they're not pulling like telemetry data from their customers and putting that in a big pool and doing machine learning on it. Um, they're explicitly right. avoiding that because of the data privacy and security implications that carries. Okay. So forward then takes it a little bit further then, because that's exactly what they do. Mm -hmm. um, they have uh, logins of some kind for a huge a number of either physical or virtual devices mm -hmm. to actually pull down, make, model, firmware, in addition to your personal uh, setup, configuration, routing rules, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Absolutely everything that they can pull from a read-only account level goes into the model of your network that makes up your the, the digital twin. So I have two questions about that. Maybe you answer them so you can tell me to shut up until you get to it. But shut I, up. Damn it. The, the two big questions I have is, one, where does that model live and run? And two... Do they take the information from your model and use it in a larger training model for all of the customers? So I think the answer to the second question is not really, but sort of maybe possibly. Okay. Um, they do go out of their way to talk about the different setups that you can possibly have. They have a model, um, a designed cloud. So you could have this run in forward networks cloud. Um, if you needed to do an offline model, it does exist and it is possible. So for things like uh, GovCloud, for example, right. you can't use forward networks cloud, right. but they cover GovCloud, no problem. So if you wanted to do a software deployment or a hardware, I mean, an, an on-prem deployment, you can. Okay. Did that hit both your questions? I wasn't listening to myself. Yeah, I would say like for the most part. So the reason that, that I keep hammering the point about the digital twins and how important it is to forward is they have at home at the lab done what can only be described as a ridiculous amount of testing on every single device that you can think of. Um, hardware and software, again, because this is both an on-prem environment solution as well as in the cloud. Mm. Um, in fact, in their models, when you abstract everything out, one of their big th theories is it shouldn't make a difference if a device is network, if a network device is on-prem or in the cloud. What we care about is packet tracing effectively. So they will test and they claim for certain devices, 120,000 tests. That's a lot of tests. 
And this is like, this is where the secret sauce comes in and how forward makes their digital twin better than somebody else's digital twin is, you know, I don't know, uh, a Cisco 9000 will behave in X, Y, and Z manner, but an HPE director will behave in ABC manner, mm -hmm. even though they're configured allegedly exactly the same. There's little nuances like that in every single piece of hardware, especially when you cross manufacturer lines, right? But if you live in a heterogeneous world where you have all these different devices, maybe you're an expert in iOS, but you're not an expert in HPE or God help you Dell. <laughs> This yeah. kind of digital twin model will really be able to help you understand what's going on, even if you don't necessarily know it at that level of expertise. Right. And the reality is most environments you're going to encounter aren't just one vendor. I and mean, you tend to use different vendors for different portions of your network. And in addition, even if it's all the same vendor, it's going to be different versions of the same software, different versions of the same firmware. You might have two devices that look for all intents and purposes exactly alike, but hey, what about all the SFPs that go in there? Because an SFP has firmware in it and that could potentially go wrong. So yeah, there's there's a lot to take into account when you're looking at what should be a relatively simple network. Right. And when was the last time you saw a relatively simple network? Um, exactly. I have a switch that's sitting over there that's turned off. Boom. <laughs> Very the one that's still in the box. <laughs> So yeah, I mean, they collect a lot of information about these devices, their tendencies, their eccentricities. And the other thing that they do is if there's a piece of your network that is not part of their model for some reason, the example that they gave was, what if you're using MPLS? Well, that means that you're using Verizon or AT&T or Comcast or whoever. They're not going to let you do a read-only scan of the devices in your MPLS network. Yeah. But because they have as much experience as they do, they can create what they call a synthetic node and utilize learned behaviors to try to follow up and build a virtual version of a virtual model as much as is possible. Right, right. They're trying to match what the inputs and outputs look like of that system without knowing what's actually in that system. Right. And I mean, when you watch when you watch billions of packets um, inflow and outflow, you can make some pretty reasonable assumptions and probably even catch a couple of edge cases where you just at least have something earmarked that says, oh, that was bizarre. I've seen this before. Mm -hmm. And then finally, they have the option um, for scanners for your entire network. So you target basically with, you know, it's probably Nmap, let's be honest. <laughs> um, but they'll tell you what I, what is out there that you haven't given them access to yet. Right. So this is twofold. Number one, when you build this digital twin, you want it to be comprehensive. Right. Now, the security part here also comes into the play because you can have a scanner on your network subnets and say, there's a new network device that's not supposed to be there. Throw an alarm. Sure. Or we forgot about that firewall that we installed in a branch office 15 years ago that is still somehow in the path of the network. Exactly right. Mm -hmm. So that's the major goal. And the, the thing that they want to accomplish with this tool is to inv ingest all of your configurations and all of your logs for all of your things. And they wanted to make clear, they talk about OSI model levels two, three, four, and seven. So they don't cover the actual jacks that you plug in and they don't, they won't tell you your cable went bad. Um, and nobody cares about five and six because those are made up anyway. Okay. <laughs> um, when you have this model, then they will check it. They will pull all of your devices periodically at a, at a uh, number of times per hour or per day or whatever that you want it to, to do. Sure. Um, it's probably not necessary to pull all of your devices every 60 seconds. <laughs> I, I, Just thinking out loud on that one. Potentially some negative consequences of doing that. <laughs> um, and that highlights too, one of the main reasons that a digital twin is such a cool idea. Anytime you do something on the network, the network devices pay attention to it. And so does your IDS IPS. So setting up this digital twin, making it as accurate as possible, and doing your what-if scenarios in the digital twin means that you don't harass your network teams. <laughs> right. That's going to make everybody happier. Yeah, yeah. 
not harassing them and also not breaking things or at least breaking right. less. So there's a couple of different things that jump out as obvious use cases. I mean, the first one is to track changes over time. Mm -hmm. Because if there is a change, they will keep track of it. If you do a firmware upgrade, they will know the config before and after. If somebody goes in and makes a change by hand, they will know the before and after. Right. And a lot of the times, especially with like firmware upgrades and, and OS upgrades, it might not have an issue that's immediately obvious. Correct. So that firmware has some sort of memory leak, but it's a memory leak that doesn't crop up for a week. So be, having that historical record of, all right, well, when's the last time we made a change to that set of routers? And you go back and go, oh, a week ago, we did a firmware upgrade. And then you check the release notes and find out there's a patch because of a memory leak. You know, it's easy to track that sort of information back. Right. Um, and incidentally, with something like that, if something comes up, uh, this is more particularly around CVSS um, releases and stuff, mm -hmm. they'll let you know, hey, mm. you have hardware device X that is... Uh, at risk because of this bug Y with a CVS score of, you know, one through 10. Right. So that's super helpful. And they can tie into things like rapid seven to get even more in depth about that type of information. Because once you have that level of inventory that is kept up to, up to date automatically by the system you've put in place, it's really helpful to have other software go out and scan that stuff for you. Right. And, um, What's interesting about that is, you know, once you know you have a problem, now you have to remediate that problem, but you don't want the cure to be worse than the disease, right? So right. having this digital twin allows you to model different ways of, you know, if there's not a patch yet and you have to like put a mediation in place, like what does that look like and how does that impact my network? And are there like two or three different options I could go with? How does each one impact my network? I can test them all in the digital twin and then pick the one that has the least negative impact while still fixing the known issue. Right. Um, and then the final, the final thing that they want to do, what they want this tool to be able to do for you, I should, I should rephrase, is be aware of the blast radius if, in fact, you do have a breach or a failure. Because, again, they have the understanding of what the uh, CVS or the bug is capable of. They know which device would have been impacted by it should it get through your defenses. And it will also know what are all the network paths to and from that device. Mm. Right. So I can imagine, especially if a network is not hyper segmented, this could be unbelievably valuable. <laughs> right. Especially if you need to isolate something. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Was that, that, that was it? You were just going to agree with me? Yeah, I was just going to, like, because you're so smart and everybody <laughs> likes you and you are a special boy. <sighs> Why do you just sit there and lie to me? Because <laughs> someone has to. Um, and then finally, all that information can be pulled automatically and it can be used to create um, dashboards for auditing type purposes and just monitoring and management type, person, type purposes. Mm -hmm. Because again, you've got all this information. You know what you have to be good at. You know what who needs to be able to communicate with who, uh, what patches have to be current to what, and you know who is going to care about that sort of thing. So, creating a dashboard with a whole bunch of you know red, yellow, green lights on it, while simplistic to some, is extremely useful to others. Right, and I, I would focus back on the audit thing a little bit because. Uh, thing that's been brought up several times in like security presentations and when they're talking about compliance and auditing is a lot of the times when you need to go through an audit, you prove that you are compliant at a specific point in time. And usually that data collection is rather onerous to do. What this gives you is because it has an up-to-date copy of everything as it, as it actually is right now, <laughs> Then when your auditor asks, are you still in compliance? You can be like, yep. And this is current as of two hours ago. So go right. away now. Yeah. I mean, what you're talking about in particular is SOC 2 type 1 is point in time. Right. SOC 2 type 2 is over time. Mm -hmm. So you can demonstrate. And that's both. obviously, it's significantly harder to prove SOC 2 type 2. Right. But now I have a 
historical record of how my network has changed, and I can use that historical record to prove compliance over time. Exactly. <sighs> and the auditor can go away. <laughs> That's the biggest part. Shoot. Shoo, 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 shoo. Here, here, here. Here's a dashboard. Go away. <laughs> Bye-bye. <laughs> here's something shiny. Sounds like a dashboard. <laughs> Get out my laser pointer. <gasps> What's that? All these visual jokes are working great on podcast. They really are. <laughs> We're killing it. Um, so how do they make all this stuff work? How do they do all this scan? So first of all, I told you that you can do integrations with third-party products like Rapid7 to get even more in-depth information. Mm -hmm. The platform itself has a query language built into it. And one of the funniest things um, I saw when, when I, somebody was talking about this uh, on an unrelated thing, um, they, they introduced with, with great flourish the 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 built-in query language and somebody in one of the chats said if this is kql i'm going to shoot myself <laughs> was it kql it is not <laughs> oh as someone uh as someone who has tried to understand kql in the past i hate it i hate it so much chris it makes no sense to my brain i just stare at it and i'm like well this is wrong but i have no idea how to make it right you know what I used? Just guess. Chat GPT. You're right. I absolutely did. <laughs> and it gave me the right answer. And I was like, well, it's worth all the environmental damage we're doing that I now don't have to write KQL. Oh, it's sad, but true. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so all of the magic that happens is based on these background scripts. And they estimated that for the average setup and deployment, 90% of what you have is just available out of the box. It's going to do what you need it to do, which is awesome. That's an incredible percentage when you think about the amount of devices and users it would need to keep track of. Should you need to do something more custom, you can simply write your own. You can develop your own using their nifty drag and drop, like deployment setup, help -a help -a later, I think is the technical term help -a -later. for it. later. I'll take one. And I'll most importantly, two. there is also a community that has a lot of scripts that have solved specific problems that you can vet and drag and drop into your own environment. And, you know, once again, that's the magic of doing something like this with a company like Forward that has so many other people using it. And just like in, as most, in most cases, um, the correct answer to a programming problem is actually just on Stack Overflow or in ChatGPT in certain unnamed people's cases. Somebody has solved this for you already. It's a matter of finding it, fine tuning it to your environment, testing it and deploying it. And in almost every case, doing being able to do something like that with a body of work that already exists is going to be faster, easier and probably more secure than trying to do it by yourself. Do it for yourself. Absolutely. So that was pretty cool. It sounds pretty cool. And yeah, I mean, the, the thing about the environment it, that I, the, the big takeaway that I got from it was this environment is exactly as complicated and in-depth and as detailed an investigator as you decide that you need it to be. Okay. Now... I don't know if they shared anything in terms of pricing or licensing, but I'm really curious to see like, how much does this thing cost me? Or is it licensed like per device or? Yes. Okay. It's licensed per functioning device. So what that means is if you've got a hardware stack of eight switches that are all working together in concert as one, that's one device in terms of licensing. Okay. So on-prem, that's a huge difference between buying, you know, every single blade versus one license for the device on top. In the cloud, it's cloud-based instances and you can do um, various different things depending on the thing that it's checking because like PaaS services are not really a device. Yeah. So that part gets that part gets a little uh, hinky as they say, <laughs> as the kids say. Yeah. Uh, but that's not much different than, you know, any other product that has to be licensed that crosses the boundary between the data center and the cloud. 
Gotcha. Um, but what's important to note is it is not based on users. It's based on the devices that it is that it has under management. Okay. And that's kind of interesting because because it tracks you know um, OSI seven, it can track users through your network, which is super helpful. Because you know who causes most of the problems on networks? People. Correct. <laughs> I mean, I didn't even have to think about it for a moment, Chris. <laughs> so the example, I mean, the example that they made was effectively um, checking user behavior for abnormalities. Now, it's really not the product to do that on a tracking based level. You would probably want like an XDR solution for that that is really much more user centric. Right. But especially going back in time, what did user Ned do two weeks ago? What did he do yesterday when we saw all those problems? If you have this thing tracking, you know, like your web application firewalls, you can absolutely follow that user via the URLs that he accesses mm -hmm. all the way through your environment. Okay. Which is pretty cool. Yeah. Um, long term, they want to try to do what, what they said long term is that they want this to be the, effectively the inventory system of record. And it stands to it makes sense because if you're pulling in all this information about network devices and all the other things and following traffic through your, your environment, you tie that to your ticketing system, you tie that to your rapid seven, it becomes if it's not in forward networks um, setup, then that device is a problem. Right. I like the idea uh, of it being a sort of source of truth. Um, one of the big challenges that I would add to that is in traditional environments, your networking devices are not going to change that much. You know, I buy this stack of routers and firewalls, and that's my network for the next five to 10 years till I have to re up my hardware. But if they're also modeling cloud based networking services, those tend to change a lot. And so do uh, anything having to do with Kubernetes networking. Like that has a tendency to spawn things that impact the flow of networks and then kill those things within you know minutes or hours. So right. what does it mean to be a system of record in an extremely dynamic system? That's, that's a real challenge. I would agree. And I think that what you would end up doing there is you have to hook in your uh, IoT auto deploys to reference forward networks and let them know here's a new device even if this new device is only going to exist for 30 minutes mm -hmm. um we didn't talk about uh, networks that were that quickly moving but they did talk about the fact that you can do things like auto deploy let forward know create as a part of your iot script involve you know create a user that's read only for forward they'll scan it immediately mm -hmm. And then, you know, if you do know that your network or that subset of the network is very fast moving, maybe that does make sense to scan it every five minutes. You know, again, sure. it's not ever going to be 100% synchronous because that's not, that's not practical and it's not feasible. Mm -hmm. How synchronous does it need to be is going to be a business decision on a company to company and a business unit to business unit basis. Right. The, it, it's the uh, trade off of, what level of fidelity do you want in the model versus how expensive it is to run that model? And the only thing that would be a true one-to-one -one is to run two identical networks and deploy right. the same changes to both every single time, which is way too expensive for basically every company. So yeah, the digital twin's a model. It's never going to be 100% fidelity, but it needs to be close enough that it prevents issues and helps you with updates and tracking without costing you too much, I guess. Right. And they actually, one of the other things that you didn't talk about with um, Field Day, which we have talked about in the past, is you also, in addition to the snack box, you get some swag. Ooh, I do like swag. Some and uh, we got swag from network, uh, network. <laughs> Just the network. <laughs> we got toy from computer. Oh, I thought you got swag from the 1974 movie. No? Okay. Not good. Not going with it. Sorry. All right. Um, and I think the, the swag that we got from forward was, first of all, it was a magic eight ball, which is pretty cool. Yeah. 
But the box that it came in asks you the questions that you can answer with the Forward Networks product, which I thought was is fascinating marketing. So I just want to read a couple of these off to you to tell you what Forward wants you to think about when you think about how this product would give you value. Okay. Does my compromised host have access to anything? Hmm. Are unauthorized users accessing an app? Is my segmentation working as intended? Do any of my devices have configuration-based vulnerabilities? There's only four sides to this box. <laughs> then that doesn't sound like a box. <laughs> I think that those are interesting questions, though, because that's really how you kind of take the idea of, oh, this is boring. This is just inventory management up to what is the secret sauce? What is the next step that this digital twin thing does for you? And is being able to not only answer questions like that, but being able to write custom questions and have it asked your network automatically on your behalf over and over and over again without ever sending one single packet to a real network device. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that that seems very helpful. I think the eight ball is kind of funny because some of the answers that the eight ball will give you are not very um, useful, like ask again later. <laughs> so. Does Ned know what he's talking about? Uh, no, definitely not. All signs point to no. See? Oh, it I works. got you may rely on it. I'm reliable, Chris. <laughs> I'm a reliable narrator in the story of me. You are reliable with an emphasis on bull. <laughs> well, I thought you were gonna say with an emphasis on lie. <laughs> Either one works. <laughs> no, was... Oh, is that better? No, no, I think mine's better. I think mine's better. Oh. Well, hey, thanks for listening or something. I guess you found it worthwhile enough if you made it all the way to the end. So congratulations to you, friend. You accomplished something today. Now you can go sit on the couch, ask your magic eight ball about your future, and shake it vigorously until it gives you the answer that you want. You've earned it. You can find more about the show by visiting our LinkedIn page. Just search Chaos Lever or go to the website chaoslever.cow, where you'll find show notes, blog posts, and general tomfoolery. And we'll be back later this week to see what fresh hell is upon us. Ta-ta for now. I read it right this week. I did it. First time for everything. First and last time. You don't. What we don't want is the users to have the users. <laughs> we, uh, I give up. <laughs>